All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us for our very first webinar in our fall 2023 series titled Waterborne Infectious Diseases Associated with Exposure to Tropical Cyclonic Storms in the United States, 1996 to 2018. It's hard to believe that we're already mid-September. I don't know about you guys, but it seems like this year is flying by. Um, but for those of you who don't know, my name is Maddie Schuler. I'm a project officer with CPHA, and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. Before we begin, we want to acknowledge that the Canadian Public Health Association's office is situated on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. They have been the guardians of this land for a millennia, and we are grateful for the example their stewardship provides. CPHA is committed to working with all First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples and their governments in realizing meaningful truth and reconciliation. Today's webinar is brought to you by the Canadian Public Health Association through the Infectious Disease and Climate Change Project. Our webinar series aims to explore current and emerging infectious disease and climate change topics to share knowledge, research, and best practices. Um, I want to take a quick minute before we begin to tell everyone about our upcoming Infectious Disease and Climate Change Forum being held virtually November 8th and 9th. The IDCC Forum, which was held once before in 2021, um, is a key knowledge exchange event for professionals and communities committed to sharing their research, best practices, and policies to deal with the impacts of climate change on infectious disease and on the health of everyone in Canada. Registration for the forum is now open and offers participants access to seven sessions over the course of two days and the opportunity to virtually connect with speakers and engage with participants. Sessions include dynamic plenaries, oral abstracts, and panel sessions. So to learn more about the forum and how to register, please visit cpha.ca forward slash infectious disease and climate change forum. Um, and I'm just going to paste the link in the chat for anyone who is interested in checking that out. A few quick housekeeping notes before we dive in. If you have any questions for our presenter today or technical difficulties, please type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. After the presentation, I will read out the questions and our presenter will have the opportunity to answer them. Um, and we do strongly encourage attendee participation and look forward to hearing some of your questions today. Secondly, our webinar is being recorded and will be made available on CPHA's YouTube channel a few days after the end of this presentation and presentation slides will also be circulated. Lastly, we would love to get your feedback. So after the webinar, please fill out our five minute survey, which will open automatically in your browser once you close Zoom. Um, and this feedback really helps to make these webinars what they are and give us a better sense of what IDCC topics you would like to learn more about. Now, I would like to introduce our speaker for today's webinar. Dr. Victoria Lynch is a postdoctoral scientist in the Environmental Health Sciences Department at Columbia Mailman School of Public Health, where she also completed her PhD in, 20, in August of 2022. Her doctoral work examined the association between flooding and 10 waterborne infectious diseases with a particular focus on Legionnaire's disease. As a postdoc, she continues to study the effect of extreme events, namely cyclonic storms and heat waves on a broader range of health outcomes and among vulnerable populations, including outdoor workers and people in carceral facilities. And with that, I will turn it over to Victoria. Hi all, let me share my screen. Okay. And does that look all right on your end, Maddie? Yes. Yes, it does. All right. I'll begin. Um, thank you so much for um, inviting me to this. As Maddie noted, I'm just a postdoc. And so it's really exciting um, to have kind of anyone interested in, in the work, um, but particularly at this stage of my career. And I'm really excited to speak to this um, type of audience where hopefully some of this is um, practically useful information. Um, so today I'm going to be uh, presenting a chapter for my dissertation, which is Waterborne Infectious Diseases Associated with Exposure to Tropical Cyclonic Storms in the United States, 1996 to 2018. Um, and this study was published in Emerging Infectious Diseases this past summer. And I'll jump right in. I, this work does focus on the United States. Um, and I obviously am speaking to the Canadian Public Health Association. I will uh, try to note um, areas where I think there are similarities or differences to my limited understanding of, um, of the situation in Canada, 
but I, I guess just disclosure up front that this is um, that my work is is primarily focused on the U.S. And the the first uh, point I hope to make is that this is a persistent waterborne disease is a persistent um, public health problem in the U.S. And um, you know, sanitation infrastructure, wastewater infrastructure. Um, theoretically eliminates waterborne infectious disease. And um, for many years in the United States, there was a dramatic decrease in common um, waterborne infections as a result. Uh, but today the, the burden of disease does persist. And what we see um, here in this figure on the left um, is that mortality rates for diarrheal disease has have increased throughout the United States. And here we're looking at it um, data from 1980 to 2014. And then on the right, we have a figure showing the incidence of Legionnaire's disease in the US um, from 2000 to uh, 2021. And you can see here a, a marked increase um, in incidence over time. And while waterborne diseases are typically um, mild infections or moderate infections, they can be incredibly serious um, if not deadly for vulnerable groups. And this includes um, elderly people, people with immunocompromising conditions. Um, for example, people with cystic fibrosis are extremely vulnerable to respiratory infections related to pathogens that form biofilms. Um, and then, and, and small children, um, STEC, which is a type of E. coli infection in, in young children can lead to hemolytic uremic syndrome, which is a very serious, if not life-threatening kidney condition. Um, so, so again, while they are um, often mild for kind of healthy immunocompetent people, um, they can be very serious. And particularly in the US, I believe this is true in Canada as well, we have an aging population. So we have more people susceptible to many of these infections or serious sequelae related to these infections. And then we also have more people with immunocompromising conditions living longer, which is wonderful. But again, the kind of group of people susceptible to serious waterborne infections um, is, is likely growing. And then I, I won't belabor the point here, um, given given this audience, I think everyone is aware of um, the, the, the uh, almost certainty of more extreme precipitation and flooding related to climate change and atmospheric warming. Um, but I do want to note that in addition to the burden of waterborne disease being a, a persistent problem, we also are in both the United States and Canada um, likely to experience more intense flooding um, and more severe tropical cyclonic storms, um, if not more, more common ones. And the work I'm presenting in a, in a few moments is focusing on cyclonic storms, but I want to emphasize precipitation um, unrelated to tropical cyclones because it can lead to catastrophic flooding um, that has a similar that may have a similar effect on waterborne disease transmission as that of um, cyclonic storms. And um, this is true uh, for this is maybe the more the, the more um, serious um, outcome for Canada, where my understanding is that there is um, less susceptible or vulnerability to um, tropical cyclonic storms, at least compared to the southeastern United States, for example, um, but that there is great vulnerability to extreme flooding related to um, spring snow melt, melting snowpack and um, snow on rain events, which can lead to really catastrophic river floods. And this image here, I'm sorry, I couldn't find a, a kind of more attractive one, um, but does include Canada as well as the United States. We, what we see here is that in winter and spring seasons in particular, most of Canada is projected to have more um, intense uh, seasonal precipitation. And so, even if the specifics of tropical cyclones are a little less um, applicable in, in much of Canada, I think the uh, focus on extreme events and catastrophic flooding um, may be uh, relevant um, to this audience. <laughs> 
okay, so hopefully I've convinced you that this is um, an important area of research and potential public health problem. And now I'll kind of outline some of the challenges to studying this. And the first one um, is that I've been talking about waterborne diseases that encompasses a wide range of pathogens. And what we have in this table here are the waterborne diseases that are monitored by US's CDC. And so they're not all waterborne diseases in the United States, um, but these are the common uh, causes of respiratory or um, enteric disease. Again, in the United States, but I think many of these are, are also common in Canada. And what we see is that there are a number of different pathogen groups, and then many specific species within those pathogen groups. And the kind of overarching question here um, is that if there is an effect of storms and flooding on transmission, is it uniform across these groups and then among the pathogens within each group? Um, and establishing this is important, um, the kind of similarities within and among groups, um, because it could inform water quality, quality surveillance um, and potential public health interventions. But right off the bat here, um, we see that there are some important differences among these groups. So I've highlighted this estimated percent of um, cases that are uh, due to waterborne transmission instead compared to foodborne transmission um, or person to person transmission. And what we see is that for these um, bacterial pathogens, Salmonella, Shigella, E. coli, very little transmission is thought to be due to waterborne. Um, what is thought to be waterborne transmission. Whereas with the biofilm forming bacteria, and this probably most notably includes Legionnaire's disease, the vast, almost all uh, cases are thought to be due to waterborne transmission. And then in between, we have these parasites. Um, today, I'll be focusing on GRD and Cryptosporidium. And, and about, while it's under 50% of, of cases are thought to be due to waterborne transmission, that is the most common um, sort of thought to be the most common source of transmission compared to foodborne or person to person. So one of the kind of central challenges for this work is trying to differentiate between what could be foodborne or waterborne transmission, specifically with the enteric bacteria, with this Salmonella and E. coli. And I'll get into that a bit later in the, in the work. The other um, important point uh, to, to note here is that the severity of these infections varies tremendously. And so if uh, kind of another challenge to this work is that epide epidemiological surveillance is more difficult with these um, infections that cause mild to moderate illness. And in the US, it's estimated that for um, many of these bacterial and parasitic pathogens, we capture a tiny fraction of the cases. And so again, when we're trying to build on this, this body of knowledge, we have to keep in mind that we are seeing um, very few cases and really only the most severe, um, those that either end up hospitalized or um, at least ill enough that they are having um, their uh, biological samples tested for a specific pathogen. Um, that's the case for, for most of these pathogens. The, again, the kind of notable exception is um, infections due to biofilm forming bacteria. Again, these are most common among people who are immunocompromised or elderly um, and, and the infections are very serious. So if one is um, infected with Legionnaires, with Legionella, for example, um, it is much more likely that that will be captured by the healthcare system. So those are some of the challenges related to this, this big, large group of, of pathogens we're looking at. Another is that they share many different types of reservoirs, and that makes it a difficult to establish potential sources of contamination. And so starting with our enteric bacteria and parasites, um, these can come, these are, um, these are, can, can come from human waste, wild animal waste, 
and then livestock waste, um, which is particularly a concern in um, concentrated animal feeding operations, these large scale farms. And um, these, these be because they can come from so many different reservoirs, um, it makes identifying the source difficult. It also poses a challenge to controlling the contamination and transmission of, of these pathogens. And then looking at our biofilm forming bacteria, um, the, the, for these pathogens, they are um, it found in the environment. So unlike animal, the, the um, animal reservoirs, if we find cryptosporidium or giardia in the environment, that is an indication of contamination. That is not necessarily the case with the biofilm forming um, bacteria. They are natural inhabitants of the water. Um, Legionella, Legionella is ubiquitous in drinking water, at least in the United States. And so again, the, the challenge here is that they um, that these pathogens are found in soil, in a wide range of water bodies, and then they also persist in water infrastructure as part of biofilm communities. And so the potential sources of contamination are diffuse. Um, And so what I um, want to keep in mind here is that um, we're looking at a number of different pathogens, and then we're looking at a number of different sources of, or potential sources of contamination. Um, and, and we're also trying to kind of balance um, uh, between finding um, Kind of rules that apply to the entire pathogen group. Is this something that we can say about all enteric bacteria or all um, Legionnaires disease? Or are, are, are we're balancing that with a need to um, really dig into the specific pathogens um, because they may have characteristics that make them uniquely vulnerable um, to transmission during flood events or um, less likely to um, cause disease during these extreme events. And so there is this, well, well for any number of policy and um, kind of practical reasons, it would be very useful to say all pathogens in this group are going to react this way. Um, we do need to balance that with kind of pathogen specific information that might lend much more clarity and insight um, to these dynamics. So just for example, among enteric bacteria, there are some um, kind of uh, generally true uh, statements about their shared traits. Um, many of them have large adaptable genomes, which allow them to persist in a wide range of environments and then a number of different animal sources. Um, so E. coli can come from cows, from pigs, from chicken, um, and then obviously humans can become infected um, but then within enteric bacteria, there is variety that might be relevant um, for establishing a kind of association with, with flooding and storms. For example, um, E. coli don't persist in the environment typically for as, as long as salmonella do, but they are much smaller and therefore they may, they may not sediment out um, during a flood event in a way that a larger Salmonella species may. Turning to parasites, and again, today I'll really be focusing on uh, Cryptosporidium and Giardia. They can persist in the environment for a very long time. Cryptosporidium has been found to persist for up to 18 months, potentially longer. Um, and, and that is kind of true of, that's kind of categorically true of these pathogens. But then between cryptosporidium and giardia, there are important differences. Giardia seems to be much more susceptible to water treatment, whereas cryptosporidium also often evades treatment. And so there again, while they're both in the same kind of group or category, pathogen-specific differences um, may yield quite different um, kind of flood disease dynamics. And then turning to these biofilm forming bacteria, as I noted, um, they're natural inhabitants of drinking water. 
or of water and they're ubiquitous in drink, drinking water. And here I'm today, I'm going to focus on um, Legionnaire's disease, which I, you know, I think it's kind of famously associated with outbreaks, but the vast majority of cases are sporadic. They're at least in the United States. Um, they are not associated with outbreak events. And there is kind of growing um, kind of suggestion that they may be an important cause of community acquired pneumonia that's not necessarily captured by healthcare systems or epidemiological surveillance, because if these cases are occurring among healthier or more immunocompetent people, they may not be um, getting their uh, kind of samples processed to the point where Legionella is being identified as the causative agent. And so that's, I'd say, kind of outside the realm, certainly of my expertise or the work today, but I want to bring this up as, um, you know, the, the, that Legionnaire's disease in particular, given its growing incidence, the severity of the infection, um, and the amount that's unknown, that this is a particularly important area of um, waterborne disease flood research is, is Legionnaire's. And again, I'm emphasizing these pathogen specific traits because um, I hope that they can inform future research. Um, water quality sampling and testing is very expensive. It's very labor intensive. And at least in the United States, there is no one rushing um, to fund the, the type of water quality monitoring or epidemiological surveillance that would allow us to do really detailed continuous monitoring. Um, and so in the absence of that type of, of data, using what we know about pathogen biology, persistence, um, kind of common pathways can hopefully it kind of point in the direction of where research is most, most critical and can inform really well-motivated research. Again, in the absence of, of the ideal situation where all water quality is, is monitored continuously. Okay, so now turning, I've introduced these pathogens. I've hopefully convinced you all that um, looking at the specifics of them is, is quite important and, and hopefully informative. Um, but now putting this in the context of a flood disease framework. And so in a sense, the mechanism for how flooding leads to transmission could not be more straightforward. Um, floods can contaminate water used for drinking, recreation, irrigation, and then if consumed, can cause infection. In practice, however, each of these steps is governed by a complex interaction among factors related to location, pathogen biology, infrastructure, and hydroclimatology. And that determines where and when floods occur. Um, these are the factors that we need to account for in our flood disease framework. And so we'll start with floods. Um, and the challenge here really is how to measure them. It's flooding unlike temperature isn't something you can just go out and get a daily measurement of, you know, this is where this on the flood scale today. And so identifying how to measure flood events, or as I'll talk about momentarily with this project, how to characterize storm events um, is, is a challenge. And there may be different ways to best capture different flood events. So for example, we have, there are different flood types. Um, here we're looking at hopefully illustrative um, images of flash floods, river floods, and storm surges. And for each of these types of, of flood generating events, um, they might be best measured by different variables. Flash floods may be best captured by rainfall intensity, so rain in a very short period of time. Um, river floods may be best described by soil moisture, which acts as an integrator of kind of standing water and, and inundation over time. And then for storms, um, and, and I'll speak at length once I get into the, the project, they may best be measured by cumulative rainfall over several days, rainfall intensity, 
um, or of course, wind speed, which can affect um, contamination in that it influence or it can destroy sanitation infrastructure. So we'll get more into that in a bit. So next in our framework, we've, we've, you know, flooding can occur, it may look different in different places, may be best measured by different variables. But again, if a flood occurred in a pristine environment, we wouldn't have a problem. So the next kind of once we've established whether or not a flood has occurred and how we're going to measure that, we then need to think about well, has contamination occurred? Um, have pathogens been mobilized in the environment? Um, and so to account for different routes of contamination um, and, or sources of contamination, we need to consider land use and sewer and stormwater infrastructure, um, which determine when floods lead to that contamination and can provide insight into its sources. And so, as I said, land use is a very important variable to consider. Um, and what we see here on the left is a picture of a concentrated animal feeding operation. Um, and what often occurs in these areas is that animal waste is kept in these large open pits as slurry. And if floods occur in you know, an area like we see here with these, these slurry pits, that's animal, raw animal waste that can then be um, mobilized by flood water and then um, dispersed into the environment. Um, so in agricultural regions, we may see flood dri driven transmit transmission um, that is related to animal waste and um, pathogens that colonize livestock. So that can be cryptosporidium in cattle. Um, and I would also want to note here that as it relates to foodborne transmission, that flooding in farm in rural areas and farmland can bring this animal waste to water that's used for irrigation. And so again, it, it's outside the, the scope of the project I'll present today, but there is kind of a just a growing question in in this area of research about how much foodborne transmission may be related um, to flood events or contaminated irrigation water. And so cases that um, through epi surveillance may look like, ah, oh, that's due to, you know, lettuce contamination, the extent to which flooding may actually lead to that, to the irrigation, contaminated irrigation water, um, you know, bringing pathogen onto crops, that's a kind of interesting um, and, and very new area of, of research. So we want to take into account land use. We also want to look at storm and wastewater infrastructure. Um, so on the left, or on the right, sorry, we see here um, the result of the combined sewer overflow. And so this occurs when um, both kind of household or municipal waste is combined with storm runoff water <clears throat> into a single wastewater um, pipe. And that can lead to the direct untreated discharge of household or municipal waste into receiving waters. Um, this is common, again, I'm not sure how it is in Canada, but in the United States, particularly in older cities and towns, combined sewer systems are very common um, and can lead to really contaminated discharges of um, wastewater and raw sewage after storms and extreme flood events. And then finally, moving on to transmissions, we've talked about um, how we measure floods and looked at those kind of variables we want to take into account for contamination. And then the last step is, well, you can have flooding, you can, can have contamination, but if you have perfect drinking water treatment and wastewater treatment, theoretically, transmission is still eliminated. Um, so now turning to some of the factors that, that may influence transmission. And hopefully at this point, it's it's not a surprise to say that pathogen biology is an important variable here. Um, as I noted earlier, the ability to persist, if not replicate in the environment is a key factor in determining whether floods drive transmission for specific pathogens. Um, biologic, biological characteristics can determine whether the pathogens evade drinking water 
treatment, as I noted with cryptosporidium. And so um, to, we really need to evaluate the role of pathogen biology in transmission, um, which is why, as I'll get to in a moment, um, I've included many pathogens in this analysis. And then finally, we also want to consider drinking water infrastructure and how it can influence transmission. Um, so drinking water systems are complex and warrant their own very rigorous um, research into how water system factors like public or private ownership, regulatory compliance, um, et cetera, how they influence flood disease dynamics. Um, but kind of broad strokes, the source of drinking waters, so groundwater, surface water, or private wells, um, may have a pretty pronounced effect on whether um, pathogens are successfully eliminated from drinking water. All right, so I've, I've introduced this framework that I think um, is grounded in our best understanding of flood generating mechanisms, pathogen biology and infrastructure, but rigorously testing it and establishing causality is hampered by limited water quality um, data and epidemiological surveillance. So our ability to accomplish the goals I've listed here, determining the source of contamination, identifying transmission routes, assessing risk with drinking water sources, all of this um, it depends on extensive and specific water quality monitoring. And that includes water used for drinking, for recreation, um, certainly for wastewater, and I'm, I'm not uh, up to date on the details in Canada, but if it's anything like the United States, that is unfortunately a bit of a, a pipe dream to hope that we can have the exact type of data we would want to um, rigorously test this framework, develop it further, and establish causality. So the, the project I'm going to present, and this time I promise momentarily, is um, trying to uh, best incorporate what we know about storms and flooding and pathogen biology to identify potential sources, potential routes of transmission in the absence of this ideal data that would allow us to establish causality. Um, so that's why I've kind of worked up to um, what I hope is a uh, good example of how using what we know about pathogen biology and floods in this framework to inform research um, that is instructive um, and useful both for public health officials and, and policy going forward um, while acknowledging the incredible limitations inherent in not having um, really detailed water quality data. And so now the actual project, long promised, um, and I've been speaking about floods generally. Now we're going to turn to um, tropical cyclonic storms specifically. And um, like with floods generally, storms can be measured um, in many different ways. And the, it, depending on the health outcome of interest, there might be different storm variables that are, that are most relevant. And I'll get into that more in, in a bit. Um, but the important thing to note um, up that kind of up front is that there are two main ways in which a um, destructive cyclonic storm could influence transmission. Um, the first is that these storms typically bring tremendous amounts of rain and storm surges, and that can lead to inundation and flooding. Secondly, they often bring destructive wind speeds to affected regions, and that can damage sanitation infrastructure. Um, and disrupt healthcare systems. So kind of through two pathways, we could theoretically see an association or an effect of storm exposure on waterborne infectious disease um, cases. And so um, kind of the research questions here are, are quite straightforward. The first is just, is um, cyclonic storm exposure associated with waterborne disease cases? Um, and then do those associations depend on the type of storm exposure or the pathogen? 
And then secondly, do storm types, for example, storms with high rain and high wind um, compared to those with high rain and low wind. Um, do storm types influence these associations? And the data to support this project come from two um, data sets. The first is the National Notifiable Disease Surveillance System. And this is weekly case count data at the state level in the United States. And you can see it here. These data come from um, local health departments compiling case reports um, doc from doctor's offices and uh, emergency department visits. They're compiled at the local level and then reported to state health departments, which then um, report to CDC. And what we see here is the, the six pathogens that I'll focus on um, for the rest of this talk. And we have Legionella, our, our friend from the biofilm forming group, um, the parasites Cryptosporidium and Giardia, and then three enteric bacteria. So um, Shigatoxin producing E. coli, Salmonella, and Shigella. And what we see um, looking at just the, the seasonality of these cases, um, for each we have the, the um, average weekly cases um, per a million people at um, uh, if we're in each of the geographic regions included in the study. And then the gray box indicates the Atlantic storm season. And what we see is that for most of the waterborne cases, um, there is either a, a distinct peak, as in the case with Cryptosporidium, or a period of elevation that coincides with the storm season. We see that case rates vary by geographic region in the United States, um, and that, so for example, Cryptosporidium and Legionnaires disease are more common in the upper Midwest or New England, whereas Salmonella and Shigella, the predominantly foodborne infections, um, are, more, are have higher case rates in the southeastern United States and Texas. And so we are seeing um, some geographic variability here. And then turning to our storm data, um, this comes from um, an incredible project by Brooke Anderson at Colorado State, uh, where she and her team combined storm track and wind speed data from the National Hurricane Center's HERDAT2 data set with rainfall data from NLDIS. And I'm sure many people are familiar, but the NLDIS data set is this very finely resolved um, meteorological data that is available at hourly resolutions, but for the purposes of this project to match our um, uh, case data, we aggregated to a uh, weekly um, resolution. Okay, so looking at um, the storms included in this project, um, again, our, our um, Case data comes from 19, we have from 1996 to 2018. Um, and so we identified all of the named uh, tropical cyclonic storms that made landfall in the United States during that, tier, that um, time period. And the inclusion criteria was just that the storm track came within 500 kilometers of land in the US. Um, and with that kind of very broad criteria, we identified 134 tropical cyclones and, and um, hurricanes. And you can see here that um, there isn't a clear uh, trend over time um, and that the number of storms that made landfall kind of varied year to year over the study period. Okay, so getting turning to our methods, um, as I've now described at length, um, Storm, floods, storms can be measured in um, very different ways. And, and uh, for this project, we decided to kind of test that by using a number of different exposure variables and thresholds. Um, so we looked at rain, wind, and distance from the storm track to define exposure. And I, as you know, in developing this project, we look at 
we looked at a number of different ways to measure rain or wind. So cumulative rainfall, rainfall intensity um, for wind, maximum wind speed, duration of gusts, um, and they're quite highly correlated within each category. And so going forward, um, I'll just be presenting on um, a, a single measure um, for wind, rain, and uh, distance. Well, obviously there's only one way to measure distance. So for rain, we looked at um, the cumulative rainfall for each storm. And in the primary analysis, we said that if the county experienced 75 millimeters or greater of cumulative rainfall, um, then they were considered exposed for the purposes of this study. And what we see on the right here is a county level um, map of the uh, affected region in the United States. And they're shaded to reflect the number of weeks with storm exposure. And again, storm exposure here is rain, uh, cumulative rainfall of 75 millimeters or greater. And not surprisingly, um, South Florida has the greatest number of storm weeks um, and then fewer as we get farther inland in the United States. For our wind exposure, um, we uh, focused on the, um, the gale force wind exposure. So that's 34 knots or greater is, is considered a, a gale force wind. And we looked at the maximum gust speed as our kind of wind definition. And here we see that the um, coast off of North and South Carolina experienced the greatest number of weeks with storm exposure, again, using this, this definition. And then finally for distance, um, we uh, just uh, kind of continued with our um, kind of broad cutoff that a county was considered exposed if it was within 500 kilometers of the storm track. So now that we have our exposure variables, our wind, our rain, our distance, we determined whether each county was exposed to a, to each storm according to these, to these definitions. And so um, here it's very simple. For each storm event, every county was either exposed or unexposed based on these thresholds. But as I noted earlier, our case data is at a state level. And so we needed to get from county level um, storm exposure um, up to a state level exposure. And to do this, we used a population weighted approach. So um, with a number of different thresholds, the very minimum, um, if a single county was exposed in a state, that state was considered exposed. And then from there we went, well, if 5% of a state population was exposed, then the entire state was exposed. And we continued with that approach up to 75% of the population. So if 75% of the population was exposed, then the state is considered exposed. And again, this is a bit of an abstraction um, but it is one of the challenges we just have to work around given that the uh, case data is reported um, at the, the state level. And so we believe that this um, population weighted approach with multiple thresholds is the best way to kind of test um, our assumptions about exposure. And then um, as I noted one of our, at the beginning, one of our um, questions was about storm types. And so for each of these um, storm weeks, we uh, categorized the storm exposure as either high rain, high wind, um, high rain, low wind, or low rain, low wind. Um, and we didn't find any any uh, storms that met a low rain, high wind uh, cat, uh, threshold. So that's why it's not listed here. Okay, for our statistical analysis, we use a conditional quasi-Poisson model um, to look at um, weeks with storms to weeks without storms. And each state was matched to itself um, and to the week of the year. So uh, in this um, 
for, so for example, if North Carolina experienced a storm in August week one of 2017, its non-storm comparison weeks were other August week ones in North Carolina. Um, and this matching allowed us to control um, for any number of location specific factors that may um, modify or, or mediate uh, these associations. And finally, the results. And so what we see here um, on the x-axis is the percent change in weekly cases associated with storm exposure. Um, and then on the y, we have our different pathogen groups. And then each column is um, showing a lag. So all the way to the left, we have the association in the week of the storm, and then one week post-storm, two, three, so on and so forth. And um, what we see with these different shapes are the different expo exposure thresholds. So I said that challenges, we have state level data. How do we say whether or not a state was exposed to a storm in a given week? Well, we use thresholds. Um, so we have any exposure, if any of the population was exposed up into if 75% of the state was exposed. Um, and so the, the population threshold um, increases from, from top to bottom. And what we see here is that for cryptosporidium infections, that there was a strong association during the week of the storm, um, at least in area, or, or at least where um, that the lower population thresholds. So if any of a state was exposed or if 5% of the state population was exposed, um, with, with that threshold, there was a, um, 44% increase or 52% increase um, in cases during the storm week. That um, association uh, then dissipates immediately and is not seen in the ensuing weeks. For Legionnaires disease, conversely, um, there is uh, no association during the storm week, but then a 30% or 31% 30, 30, increase um, in cases one week after the storm 42 in the second week, and then 39% in the third week. Um, and that association is stronger as the population exposed as that threshold um, increases. And then for E. coli, um, we see a strong association um, at one and two weeks post-storm that then attenuates by three weeks post-storm. And so, um, this, again, there's this, this clear kind of increase where the, the strength of the association increases as more of the population is exposed and then a return to normal conditions. And I, um, that I, I noted that, that we, um, for the main analysis, I'd present just a kind of single uh, storm uh, exposure uh, cutoff. And, and so what we see here is when um, the, when a, a exposure is defined as 75 millimeters of rain. Here, just to kind of test um, the, the strengths of these associations, we're looking at different um, rainfall thresholds. So light blue is 55, 75, and then dark blue is 100 millimeters. And then as the um, threshold for storm exposure becomes more stringent, the associations are actually stronger. Um, so here we can see with these dark blue, with these worse or rainier storms, um, we actually see a stronger association um, with an increase in cases for Legionnaires disease and for E. coli. And then finally turning to the storm categories I described. Um, and here we have the same um, X and Y axes. Um, but now the color refers to the storm type. So this red are the kind of most destructive high rain, high wind, and then uh, green are low rain, low wind. What we see um, with Giardia, interestingly, is that there's actually a decrease in cases during the storm week um, for all, um, for all rain, uh, storm types. Whereas for Cryptosporidium, um, there's actually a strong increase in cases um, 
when with the most destructive storms with these high rain and high wind storms, um, but that it's lagged, that unlike what we saw with our primary analysis, that um, the, the increase in cases uh, was only apparent three weeks post storm. And then finally for Legionnaires disease, what we see um, is that there is a positive association with high rain, low wind and low rain, low wind storms, but that it's delayed and attenuated um, relative to uh, our, our other results. And so what we see, um, just kind of in summary, is that the cyclonic storm exposure was associated with cases of Legionnaires disease, E. coli, and cryptosporidium. Um, that the strength of the association, pardon me, the strength of the association um, increased with exposure and population thresholds for Legionnaires and for E. coli. And that the exposure to storm types um, was associated with attenuated, um, delayed, or extreme effect estimates. And the interpretation for this in fact, I'll go back, is that um, they really, it really demonstrates the um, difficulty of looking at rare extreme events. And so for cryptosporidium here, um, this pronounced increase three weeks post storm, digging into that data, it seems like that was really driven by a particularly destructive storm that hit Texas in 1998 and took out um, multiple water treatment, wastewater treatment plants in central Texas and led to an outbreak of well over 700 cases of cryptosporidium um, associated with that storm. And I, I certainly want to be um, careful here to not overstate these findings that with, with storms which are rel with cyclonic storms which are relatively rare to begin with and then in particular with very destructive storms the most rain and the most wind there are very few events and so we're really looking at only a few major events um so a a large outbreak with a single event can drive um this association that we see here and so this is another challenge just to research in this field that um, the most destructive storms are are quite rare. Um, and so establishing clear associations with specific um, waterborne diseases um, is, is limited. Speaking of limited, um, some limitations here, as I now noted several times, there is the geographic resolution of the data. So there is this spatial mismatch between storm data and state level case data. And then of course the contamination routes are not explicitly included in the statistical analysis. Um, we, again, that's why I wanted to look at so many different types of pathogens um, that because pathogens can be associated with different sources that maybe that lends some insight into, into potential sources. Um, but again, that's not explicitly included in the model. And then of course, um, we can't account for behavior changes with this type of data. So something that's kind of well-established in the disaster epidemiology literature is that with, particularly with really extreme storms, people may leave, evacuate the area. And so while they may be more likely to be exposed to cryptosporidium in, in, in flood water, um, if they've evacuated, then they're not um, experiencing that exposure. Um, so again, it's, it's a, to, to thoroughly um, uh, look at all of these associations, we would need data on how people um, physically, geographically react to these storm events. And so to wrap up, I'll just um, kind of identify what I think are some really important areas of research in the future. Um, first is looking at rural areas and focusing on rurality. Um, and that's because rural areas more likely rely on groundwater and often have small community water systems. And so this is obviously looking at the United States, but I believe that this is these numbers are actually quite similar in Canada, that about 30% of community water systems rely on groundwater. Um, these systems, again, at least in the United States, 
have only recently been subject to um, drinking water standards because for many years they were thought to be more protective, rel protected relative to surface water. Um, they, it was only in 2006 in the US that our EPA um, implemented groundwater rules. And so um, in these rural areas, many of these systems are still in the process of implementing drinking water protections. And in fact, here we're looking at in blue areas where source water protection has been implemented, red is not implemented and gray is not reported. You see that me most community water systems either haven't implemented or haven't reported um, implementing drinking water source protections. And these again are disproportionately in rural areas. So there's this kind of overlapping risk factor of relying on groundwater or private wells, which are completely unregulated, relying on these sources, and then not necessarily um, having drinking water monitoring or testing to meet regulatory standards. Um, and then I, I would add that in, at least in the United States, in rural areas, populations are often older um, and have more limited access to healthcare. So I think there, there is the potential for this, no pun intended, kind of perfect storm of both vulnerability to contamination and then a population that is that is really susceptible to many waterborne infections. Another important area of future research is um, a focus on health disparities and storms as a driver of environmental injustice. Um, so both vulnerability to flood exposure and to health infect, effects related to them is concentrated among groups within the population that experience multiple sources of social and health inequity. And in the United States, I would say that this is kind of maybe most clear in Appalachia. Um, so for us, that's in Kentucky, West Virginia, Virginia. These are communities that are extremely vulnerable to multiple flood types, um, river floods, flash floods, because they're very mountainous and tropical cyclonic storms. Um, these are areas where the population is often very poor and very hard hit by the opioid epidemic in the US and to me, it's a clear example of kind of the, the cumulative effects of um, kind of disenfranchisement in these communities, geographic very vulnerability to storm events, and then the absence of kind of the social and healthcare infrastructure um, to meet these challenges. Um, this is so this is true of communities like those in Appalachia, certainly rural communities, but then also communities. Um, where a large portion of the population are not English speakers. That can be a, a huge risk factor for evacuation and storm preparedness. Um, and then certainly in the United States, communities that have a greater proportion of public housing are also disproportionately located in flood zones. Um, so I, I think this is, this is an important area of research for any number of reasons, but at, at least for me personally, the one that's most personally motivating is that it's... Um, a very, very um, serious and important driver of health disparities. And then finally, again, I kind of noted this up front, but um, the work I present today focused on tropical cyclonic storms, but I think that its principles are um, extend beyond just named cyclonic storms because extreme floods can come from other flood generating events. I noted that in in um, northern United States and certainly in Canada, the combination of snow melt and snow on rain flooding can lead to really destructive and long lasting flood events. Um, and these, again, while not associated with a named cyclone, um, may be just as or you know kind of comparable in terms of their health effects. And what I'm showing here is from work that I'm I'm kind of in progress, I'm working on at this exact moment that is trying to answer this question of looking, trying to identify extremes unrelated to cyclones. Um, and, and what we see, this is just a very basic figure of a flood count by um, zip code in the, in the US. And the kind of darker colors are weeks with, um, or are, are uh, the number of flood events. Um, and what we see here is that Again, I noted Appalachia is very vulnerable, but also um, the upper Midwest in the United States, right up against the Canadian border, has had a number of 
um, catastrophic flood events unrelated to cyclonic storms. And these seem to be mostly snowmelt driven river floods. Um, and so I just bring that up um, to kind of demonstrate that um, while, while today I talked mostly about cyclonic storms, one of the reasons I wanted to walk through that flood disease framework is because I think it's um, really important to consider extremes outside of of just hurricanes and tropical storms that that may get more kind of attention and press. Um, and also wanted to note this to a Canadian audience where um, my, again, limited understanding is that um, flood uh, or that kind of river floods and extensive long lasting um, spring floods could be a very, a very, very serious problem. Um, and so I realized I've kind of eaten up time here but I'll end there. I um, just want to acknowledge that, again, I know this was a um, project that I conducted as a doctoral student. So I would like to thank Jeff Shaman, my advisor, and everyone in the Shaman Lab Group at Columbia, um, my committee members. Um, again, it was a dissertation project. And then my funding sources. Sorry, went a bit long there. <laughs> No, no, that's okay. Thank you so much, Victoria. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, and it sounds like a lot of really rich, important areas for future research as well. So thank you so much. Um, if you're able to stay for a couple minutes, I will open up the floor for maybe just one or two questions for any participants um, to put in the Q&A feature. Now would be um, the time. There's a couple minutes there. But um, again, thank you so much, Victoria, for sharing your time and expertise with us today. Um, perhaps I will just ask one question um, because the majority of our audience does come from um, kind of a public health uh, standpoint. Um, do you have any advice for any public health units or professionals who are looking to do waterborne disease surveillance or research? Any advice? <laughs> well, I, yes, sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's well, it's I, I'm torn between bigger picture. I mean, I think fundamentally advocating for investment in infrastructure and water quality monitoring is the kind of upstream um, uh, kind of activity that all of us can do. Mm -hmm. But particularly as a public health professional, I think that to the extent that um, when conducting epidemiological surveillance or, or even just speaking with healthcare providers, emphasizing the need for testing. So I know in the United States, so many people go to the doctor and they don't feel well. And the doctor says, eh, you probably have some bug. When you're eight, when healthcare providers say, no, I'm going to get this tested and we're going to decide, you want to determine whether you have E. coli or salmonella. That's one step of actually developing a better epidemiological surveillance base. And I know in the United States, and I've done some of this work, that can be really local health departments working with providers to say, no, it's important that we do this. The other is in epidemiological surveillance to include information about drinking water sources, whether it's municipal, private well, and then also recreational water exposures. And I know that I, I didn't have enough time today to kind of get into detail about recreational water, but it's um, potentially a very important source of exposure, particularly after these storm events when people go swimming. Right. Um, so to the extent that local health departments can encourage providers to test, um, change their own surveillance practices to include information on environmental exposures, that's kind of a, I guess, more detail or kind of nitty gritty um, piece of advice. The other would be to, if, if anyone has any control over this, <clears throat> to do some rapid data collection after storm events. Again, I spent some time talking about <clears throat> the ideal situation. The ideal is pretty far, but even having kind of short-term water monitoring after river floods or storm events, that um, would be a huge step in the right direction because at least in the United States, that data are, those data are rarely collected. Right, right. 
Thank you so much, Victoria, again, for sharing your time and this research with us today. Um, and thank you everyone for joining. Um, there are tons more webinars lined up in our fall 2023 series, so stay tuned. Um, there's even one next Tuesday titled One Health and Tick-Borne Diseases with Dr. Jacqueline Badcock. Um, so we hope to see you there um, and have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much. Take care.